work of uh, quite a number of people here. So as we will see. So first, maybe though, just to give you uh, a brief history of you know where I'm coming from and sort of what's the point. So uh, it's all about dualities, this work, right? And there are already many dualities that uh, exist in the world. So for, for example, well, there, there are particular dualities between topological spaces and bundles over those spaces and more algebraic things like rings and algebras, for example. Uh, I said Gelfand duality, which, which was just mentioned before and which uh, I think was also mentioned yesterday. I mean, this is a standard c star algebraic duality that you meet. Um, and it's a duality between mutative c star algebras on the one hand and locally compact Hausdorff spaces on the other. Okay, but there are some other more kind of algebraic dualities, which maybe you might not be so familiar with. So for example, there's this work of Kaimel from the seventies where he looked at idempotent generated torsion-free commutative algebras right, over some, some ring. Right? And he was able to show that these are also in, in a duality with certain kinds of compact Hausdorff spaces, specifically the zero dimensional ones. And again, I think this is mentioned before, these are generally known as stone spaces, right? These zero dimensional compact Hausdorff spaces. So this is a kind of a kind of stone duality, I guess, but we'll talk more about stone duality again later. And there were also these dualities due to Pierce and Downs Hoffman. So Downs Hoffman did some C star algebraic work, but this this work I'm mentioning here is actually more algebraic. So they uh, they showed that by regular rings, which if you're interested, these are the, the ones where every principal ideal is is actually uh, generated by a central idempotent. That's not too important. Anyway, some nice class of rings. But these are in duality with bundles now of simple rings over stone spaces, same spaces here. Okay. And, uh, and what? Hmm? Ring. Without ideals, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, just algebraically simple, right? Because these are all just algebraic. Um, what about, what about non-commutative extensions? Well, I guess this last part does kind of include non-commutative c algebras, but it's still, uh, well, kind of commutative in some sense. There are more truly non-commutative uh, dualities, well, again, which can be kind of viewed as dualities. For example, this work that's also come up due to Kumjan and Renault, where you're looking at Tartan pairs of c algebras, and then these are, in a certain sense, in duality with twisted, effective, locally compact Hausdorff with hard group blocks. Uh, one thing that is worth pointing out here, though, is that there is there isn't really that much functoriality here. I mean, you could you could say it's functorial with respect to isomorphisms in in both categories. Right? Uh, so you know, if you have to it's an effective, uh, you know, locally compact house of Atar groupoids. Look at the corresponding Cartan pairs. If they're isomorphic, well, okay, the the groupoids have to be also isomorphic. But naturally, you would uh, you would like to get or, or be able to extend the duality to more general morphisms, like for example, in the original Gelfand duality, or general continuous map. Um, um, and there's also this much more recent work by these Brazilian authors right here. <laughs> so where they were looking at these very similar kinds of more algebraic objects where you have quasi Cartan pairs, and they again show that these are these are dual in a sense to twisted effective ample group points. Um, and again, though, there is this functoriality aspect. So it's functorial with respect to isomorphism, but really it would be nice if you could extend these to these dualities to more general kinds of Okay, and that's uh, well, that's kind of the question. I want to address today. So, so if you're looking at these results and comparing them to the more algebraic work that's come before, you, you might wonder, well, what, what if we look at, would there be some kind of analog of the Pearson Downs or Hoffman stuff, but, but more like this, these Cartan pairs or these quasi Cartan pairs? Could you, could you look at, say, bundles of rings over ample groupoids, maybe simple rings, maybe they don't even have to be simple, and then show that these are actually uh, in some kind of duality with a a nice class of rings, maybe with some extra data, maybe with some special subalgebras, or maybe maybe even sub semigroups that give you sort of the extra data you need to make this a true. Quick question. Sure. Uh, in number two for the non commutative stuff, the uh, algebra part to me sounds like more general than the algebra part for number one, but then the groupoids thing seems less general. What am I confused about? <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's that's kind of true, right? So yeah, your your groupoids are more restrictive because they are ample, not not just uh, not just a tile. Uh, but yeah, I mean, is uh, are the quasi cartan pairs? Are they really are the quasi? I guess 
it's effective shouldn't be there. Yeah. Or bisexual. Oh really? You don't need you don't need effective ample group points for really? Okay. Okay. Right. We'll need effective then. <laughs> this which bisection hypothesis. Yeah, that's right. I never never like that. It's like, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But is that yeah, so that, that local bisection hypothesis, is that included in quasi carton or equivalent, like... equivalent. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so sorry for misquoting this this work here, but yeah, but then I guess still yeah things things are not directly comparable i guess right so you delete effective but you've still got ample whereas here you've got these these uh you know one cartons they don't well what they don't have they don't have the seeks to structure they don't have a norm in particular. i don't know okay there's a lot of yeah they're very they're analogous but i'm not sure they're directly comparable uh, yep okay so that's well that's those kind of joys but there are there's also been quite a lot of work in a kind of parallel world of of lattice theory and semigroups. So these really go back to, you know, even further back than the, the Gelfand duality, back to this classic stone duality, which is a duality between these order theoretic structures, these Boolean algebras on the one hand, and these, again, these stone spaces, these very special compact outdoor spaces. And this, uh, these, you know, this has been generalized in kind of various directions in uh, for quite a while. And so I've mentioned a few names here. I've probably missed some, some names, but I just want to give you the impression that you know, this this has been worked on for a while and, and is still in some sense being you know extended to this very day. <laughs> and uh, but more interesting for me at least are these these more kind of non-commutative extensions due to uh Kudrotseva and Lawson's Gunner. And and Mark was very insistent here that I I point out that, that this is his work, not Jimmy D. Lawson, who appears up here, who's who's uh, famous in the main theory. So for the rest of my talk, any reference to Lawson will be referring to Mark, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so yeah, on the one hand, you have these these sort of non-commutative versions of Boolean algebras, and they're they're dual to these these bundles of of stone spaces over each other. And they also a bit later have have these uh these even you know more interesting dualities where you look at say Boolean inverse semigroups and ample groupoids. I think this is discussed a bit before, and also uh, also, even more general Boolean restricted semigroups, and there you have to look at these more general ample categories rather than ample ample group dates. Um, but then the natural question is: is again, well, what if you were to try and look at some kind of bundle version? So here they they were looking at bundles of stone spaces, but what if you were to look at maybe some kind of bundles of of categories over group weights? You know, would this correspond to some even more kind of general, I don't know, restriction semigroup or some other kind of semigroup that you can axiomatize in, a, in an algebraic way and uh, and moreover could you could you perhaps even use this to to go back to the previous slide and actually actually derive the sort of ring and algebra analogs uh, from the semigroup stuff could you could you maybe do most of the work in semigroup world and then just with a little bit of extra work get some kind of ring and algebra, result, algebra results almost for free so this is yep i'm really sorry i, I walked in late but yeah. i don't know if you said something about what, what you mean by it category a bundle of categories over a group or yeah i mean i haven't been specific i will give you a precise definition but i mean you can imagine what it is right you have you have a total uh, it's, it's, it's a little too wild so I'm not, <laughs> 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 but yeah i mean just yeah you've got a you've got a base groupoid and each fiber is is uh well it's a space but then the total thing is a, is a category and the, the product in the category sort of behaves nicely with respect to the product in the groupoid and but don't yeah i'll go into more details later yeah Okay, so so yeah, but before we sort of dive into the, the newer stuff, I thought it's instructive to really uh, go back to the the original stone duality. So this was mentioned, I think, in in Alejandra's talk, but uh, but for my talk, I think it's really instructive to to go into details a bit more to see how we're generalizing this. So one direction is is pretty pretty clear. So you start with a stone space. How do you get a Boolean algebra? What do you do? You just look at the Clopen sets ordered by include. And you immediately see that these do indeed satisfy all the, the necessary conditions for a Boolean algebra. The minimum, namely the empty Clopen set, they have a maximum, the whole Clopen space. Uh, meets are just intersections, you know, and likewise joins are unions, unions of Clopens are Clopen, right? And complements are just set theoretic complements. So complement, I mean, in the, the order theoretic sense, I guess, the lattice theoretic sense. And last but not least, they're distributed just because we're we're dealing with concrete sets and unions and intersections. We know that they're distributed, right? 
well, that's easy. Going from stone spaces to to Boolean algebras. What about the reverse? In fact, what what if we start with something even a little bit easier? Let's say we have got our Boolean algebra of Clope and sets, and we want to recover the space. How would we how would we do that? Well, you can note immediately that every point in your space defines a very special subset of your Boolean al algebra, namely ultra filter. So these are nothing more than these maximal, proper, down directed upsets, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, I've written them down here, but it's, I mean, it's obvious, right? If, if X is contained in O and N, well, then X is definitely gonna, con gonna be contained in their union. So it's downwards directed, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So you get these ultra filters and you, you would hope that these would have recover the points in, in some sense. And indeed they do. That the slightly less trivial thing to show is that given an, an arbitrary ultra filter, well, indeed that, that actually has to be one of these ultra filters. It has to come from some point, a unique point. And yeah, it's just a little, little compactness argument. So you get this bijection. And uh, moreover, it, it, uh, what do you notice? Well, you notice these, well, yeah, these clopen sets get mapped to all those ultra filters uh, for which, you know, uh, we look at all those clopen sets which contain X or put another way, it's really just saying all those ultra filters which contain that, that fixed clopen set, right? And so when you topologize ultra filters in this way, which you can do in an arbitrary Boolean algebra, like look at all ultra filters containing some fixed element. Well, then you find that this bijection you have really is, is a homeomorphism as well. So you have, you have recovered the space. So now you know how to recover the space and you, you go the next step. You say, well, what if I was just given some abstract Boolean algebra, can I somehow create the space out of nothing? And indeed you can, all you do, you again, look at ultra filters, again, look at this natural topology we have here, and, uh, or, or put another way, you can say, I'm identifying ultra filters with their characteristic functions. And the topology in this case is nothing more than the, the product topology on, you know, the product of zero one. So this is a stone space and you can show ultra filters are closed here. So this is a closed subspace. It must also be stone space. Um, and, and in this way, you've, you've created the space in which to, to represent your abstract Boolean algebra. So, so I guess there's, there's some more stuff to show, particularly with the functoriality, but, but basically this shows that indeed Boolean algebras are a dual to stone spaces by these two maps. From Boolean algebra, look at ultra filters to get the space. From space, look at clopens to get the Boolean algebra. So that's the community of world. What about something yeah. at Yeah. Does that give you a contravariant or oh, an equivalence of categories? Yeah. yeah. So they're, 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 I haven't, I've been glossing over the morphisms part just because I don't want to get into it. But indeed, if you have continuous maps between the, the spaces, then then these will indeed give you, um, uh, yeah, they'll give you Boolean algebra homomorphisms and vice versa. Boolean algebra homomorphisms also give you continuous maps. Opposite direction? Opposite direction, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just like with girl panjo up, you know. Yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, well, first I need to talk about group ways, but fortunately, a lot of people have done that, so I guess I don't need to, to dwell on that. <laughs> yeah. Suffice it to say, I'm, I'm looking at group voids in the usual way we do in operator algebras, where there are no, there are no objects as such, there are just a collection of arrows with a partial operation, uh, where all those arrows have inverses, and you also get these source and range units like so. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll leave the topology for a little bit later. At, at this point, you can already just start looking at bisections or slices, right? Just those, those special subsets of your groupoid on which the range and source map are injected. And you immediately see that the associativity of, of G uh, immediately passes to these, these subsets when you just take products in the, the way you would expect, right? You just look at all products of Bs and Cs wherever the product is, is actually defined. Okay, not only that, but you, well, you immediately see that if you look at subsets of the unit space, then the product is, is actually just an intersection. And in particular, it's commutative. So what this is saying is the idempotence in particular commute in this, this little semi-group you've defined here. And last but not least, you can check that if you look at some bisection, you look at the corresponding inverses, then you get these, these uh, equations showing that in the semi-group of arbitrary bisections, it really is a kind of generalized inverse. And all this is saying that, that really it's an inverse semigroup, right? Arbitrary bisections will always form an inverse semigroup. Well, there's also a bit of, uh, well, there's a bit of order structure, a bit of ladder structure as well. So the order here, the natural order of course would be inclusion, 
But the nice thing is this can also be described more algebraically in, well, I guess various ways, but in particular by, by this way here, which is one standard way of defining the natural order, natural order on a, any inverse semi. -group. So it's this natural algebraic order really just corresponds to inclusion. Now these arbitrary bisections, they definitely form a meat semi lattice. Take any two bisections or slices, just look at their intersection. Again, it will be a slice. The slightly nasty thing, which is uh, you have to be careful to avoid is, is thinking that it's a joined semi lattice. So not because of course you can, you can have two slices, that union is no longer a slice. You know, just because source or range is injective on two things individually doesn't mean it will be on injective on the entire union. <coughs> However, there are there are some joins. So in particular, if you look at orthogonal elements, so again, there's a purely algebraic characterization here, but if you want to explain it more in terms of intersections in unions, two things are orthogonal if they're disjoint, and moreover, the, the union is actually a bisection. So in that case, orthogonal things, they have joins, uh, and you also have all these, these relative complements, right? So as long as, I guess I'm mainly thinking of when, when O is contained in N, right? But, uh, or is it, is it vice versa? Oh, yeah, when N is contained in O, yeah, o, N is contained in O. But I, I guess it works in general, right? That if you just throw away the, the parts of N in O, well, then you're, you have something disjoint, but moreover, now you've made these two things orthogonal, so they do actually have Okay, and the uh, well, the item potents are just subsets of the unit space. These are also distributive, just because, as we mentioned, you know, products are in this case just intersections, right? And joins always exist in, in this particular case, and they're always just unions. Okay, so these arbitrary bisections now these form what's known as a, a Boolean inverse semigroup. They won't get you all Boolean inverse semigroups, though. These are only very special kinds because we're dealing with arbitrary bisections. We want to get all Boolean inverse semigroups. Well, then we have to be uh, a bit more well smarter and, and introduce a topology and not look at all the bisections, but only very special kinds of bisections. So topology. This is where I I introduce a tal, and I'm going to use the the definition I think Lisa mentioned earlier, which is that uh, a group body is a tal if and only if it has a basis of open bisection which is closed under taking pointwise inverses. And pointwise products. Uh, or put another way, it's just saying arbitrary open bisections, they're both a basis for the topology and an inverse sub semigroup of this semigroup where we already defined of arbitrary bisections. And this is equivalent to the perhaps more usual definition where you say, for example, the, the source map is a, a local homeomorphism, but, uh, but perhaps a better way to look at it is, is basically all the structure maps have to be both continuous and also open maps. So there's, um, there's various results by Rosendi, for example, where you say, you know, some, some subset of these operations are open and some subset are continuous, and then it automatically implies the others are open continuous, et cetera. But in the end, they're all open continuous maps. Okay, and now it, uh, it's easy to define ample in a very similar way. You just say a groupoid is ample if it has a basis now of compact open bisections. Again, closed under inverses and or put another way, all of those compact open bisections can form a basis for the topology and an inverse sub semigroup of B of G. Um, and again, this is this is equivalent to the more standard definition, I guess, of saying that it's it's a tile, but also zero-dimensional load. And yeah, I should point out here, I'm I'm assuming now I'm gonna maybe do something non-standard and take Hausdorff as really sort of part of AMPL. I don't want to have to keep saying Hausdorff AMPL. All my AMPL groupoids from this point on are, are going to be Hausdorff, right? just, to, just to be clear. Okay, now, um, and now if we look at these, these compact open bisections, some AMPL groupoids, well, I guess maybe even at this point, it doesn't have to be AMPL, but if you look at the, the compact open bisections and you look at these operations we had where we were looking at, at intersections and relative complements, et cetera, well, uh, and unions when when they they exist when they're actually bisections well uh, again they'll always be compact open so long as both the o and n are compact open so these form a, a further boolean inverse sub semi group if you like of the and these these will give us the boolean inverse semi group So if you have a, a Boolean inverse semigroup, how do you so how do you define an ample groupoid? I guess we did the easy part, right? From an ample groupoid, you get this 
boolean inverse semigroup of convex open bisections. How do you do the reverse? Well, you can basically do it the same way as in the classic stone body. So you look at ultra filters now, and again with this, this natural topology. And the nice thing about doing things with ultra filters as opposed to some kind of you know, groupoid of germs construction or something is that defining the, the product of two ultra filters is very easy. You just look at the product of the individual elements of those ultra filters. There's a slight issue in that that may not be upwards closed. So what do you do? You take the upwards closure. But as long as zero was not already a product of some elements in U and V, then the upwards closure will again be an ultra filter, uh, and it will, will indeed define a groupoid operation on the ultra filter. Okay, and uh, and this is also, I guess, where you see the the nice thing about this definition of a tar is, is it's now easy to prove it's a tar because you start looking at these these sets, this basis, this canonical basis for your ultra filters, right? And you can show that this is a, a compact open bisection. And you can show that, well, you can, I guess it's pretty immediate really, that if you look at the ultra filters containing A, well then all those inverses will of course contain A inverse and likewise with the product. So you've shown you, you have already this canonical compact open basis of bisections, both on the inverses and products. Okay, therefore it's an ample group. And uh, moreover, if you, I guess, this is the recovery part, if you look at some, some inverse semigroup of this form, compact open bisections for some ample G, well, you again get this, this bisection between the points and the, the ultra filters uh, defined by that particular, by those points, right? And it's a homeomorphism with this, this topology. So you can recover the group point. Yeah, I mean, you, and you can recover it also in terms of the, the product structure as well. So if you look at the product of the elements, and look at the corresponding ultra filter. Well, that's the same as the the product in the ultra filter groupoid corresponding groupoid. Yep. Uh, that's not typically house filters, is it? No. Uh, which the the ultra filters? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm really I'm interested in the case where you have meets all the time. And if you have meets, then I think the whole thing is Hausdorff. If you don't have meets, then only the unit space is Hausdorff. You're right. So yeah. But yeah. Maybe yeah. Yeah, in my, defin uh, my definition of a Boolean inverse semigroup, I guess I never said it explicitly, but I would assume there's always means, yeah. just, just to make things easier. Okay. Okay, and so and this now it gives us Lawson's uh, uh, non commutative stone duality. So it's, it sort of works in the same way. You start off with some Boolean inverse semigroup, look at the salt fiddlers, that gives you an ample groupoid. Reversely, given an ample groupoid, look at the compact open bisections, you have a nice. Um, uh, a nice Boolean inverse semigroup. And it's exact, this is exactly a also bijection, but it's also functorial with respect to these uh, these special kinds of functors. I think Mark calls them covering functors, but some people call these star bijective functors, and there are various, various other names. But anyway, there is also a, a functorial aspect to this, which is very important, but I'm not going into detail. Yeah. Okay, so let me just, uh, yeah, take a break from this before going to the the more general stuff, which is you know, the stuff I've actually been doing. And just talk for a second about the difference between um, meets and expectations. So if you have a, let's say a concrete ample groupoid to start with, uh, then, then you can always look at, you, know, you have some open, open bisection, then the largest idempotent will simply be the intersection of that, that particular bisection with the unit space, right? In particular, there will always be such a, a largest item potent, right? And in a in more abstract setting, if you have an inverse semigroup, as long as you always have meets, then you can likewise define a kind of expectation by just taking the meet of A with its sort of source item potent or range item potent, doesn't matter. This will always be the maximum item potent below that particular element. Um, each notice that this is uh, this, this is really an if and only if in the sense that if if every element does indeed have a maximum um, below an I maximal item potent below it, uh, then indeed it has meets, and you can define the meets more explicitly from this this map phi you have here, either by either of these two equivalent things. Okay, and he also noticed that it is a an expectation at least as far as the multiplicative structure goes, in the sense that if you if you take some element which is e, which is already in the range of phi, then it's it's basically a <coughs> bimodule map, right? You can always just take it outside and inside, doesn't matter. And uh, and it and it really is idempotent on its range. It's really phi squared is phi. 
And there are a couple of other properties which I don't think were explicitly noted by Leach, but will turn out to be kind of important for us. And that is that this, this map here is, is shiftable in the sense that if you have a product ABA, then it doesn't matter if you apply phi to the first product or the second, you'll always get the same thing. And it's also what I call bistable in the sense, again, that if you have a product that happens to already land within the range of phi, then you can apply phi to either A or B, and you'll still remain inside the range of phi. There's just two conditions to note. So yeah, they will soon play a greater role. So with this in mind, let me now dive into the, the more general structures that we really want to look at, these ample category functions. So the, the right definition of a category, of course, is a group word without inverses. <laughs> But uh, by that, I just mean that I'm looking at it in a similar way. I don't like objects. I just want to have this partial operation on all these uh, these things, these arrows, if you like. Uh, we have source and range maps, sure, but we just don't have don't have inverses anymore. Okay. And likewise, you can again define what a topology on a category, uh, what it would mean for a topology on a category to be a tile, and in, in pretty much exactly the same way. But all the structure maps, the source range, and the, the product even. They will have to be uh, open, uh, continuous maps. And now I think I, I have to explicitly say locally injective or group words. I think you can actually derive that, but you know, I really, really have to say it explicitly. Okay. And yeah, before I to define the categories, I first need this little technical term called a, an ISO code vibration. So it sounds, sounds bad, but this is not my fault. This is something from category theory. Um, and it's an ISO code vibration is just a, it's just a functor. Uh, but where, where, you know, functor says that if the product of A and B is defined, well, then the product of row A and row B is defined, and these are the same. But the ISO code, ISO code vibration says the converse, that if this product is defined well, then A, B already had to be a well-defined product. So it's a strong kind of functor. Yeah, so an atal category bundle is going to be uh, an open, officially an open continuous ISO code vibration between a category, an atal category on the one hand to an atal group void on the other. So it's, uh, so officially, officially it's a map, right? As with all bundles, but, but usually when we think of it, what we really think of is the, the group void is some kind of base space and C is some total space, which you can split up into fibers over, over G. I don't understand what this says. Yeah. In the so vibration condition. So <laughs> row A, B with row A, row B, that's yeah. always true for a functor. It's okay. If A, B is defined, well, then row A, row, row B is, is defined and these are equal, right? That's true for a functor. But what is, I don't think generally not true is if you have a functor and you know that row A times row B is defined, then it's not necessarily true that A, B is defined, right? Okay, right. So it's an injectivity. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you could, maybe that's a better way of saying it. I think, I think it's equivalent to basically saying the functor is injective on units or uh, on the, yeah. the identities. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's another way, right? I guess, I guess I like this definition because. Because when you're, I don't know, when you're dealing with bell bundles where, where you may not, your total category may not even be a category, may, you may not even have identities, then you can still define what a, a nice low code vibration is. But I mean, that's, that's another issue, yeah. Okay, so this is our definition of a, an atal category bundle. Okay, so sections are, of course, just elements which maps on the base space, which pick out some element in, in each fiber. I'll be particularly interested in these entire category bundles, which have a, a zero section, which does what you expect, right? Whenever you multiply something by zero, well, you again get a zero. But there are many zeros, one for every single single fiber. Okay. And and I'll need, well, to get this sort of nice duality, I'll, I'll need a couple more conditions. So I'll need, I'll need G to be an ample group void to start with. I'll need the row to have the zero section. And I will also need each fiber to contain at least one invertible element. That's all. This is the, some people call it the core. It's just the invertible elements of your category, the, the maximal subgroupoid, if you like. Okay, and so, yeah, I'll need this. You can you can think of this, this <laughs> some kind of strong version of, of saturation, if you're used to dealing with saturated spell bundles. So I'm gonna call this object, which is gonna be the sort of core object we wanna look at. I'll call this an ample category bundle. Give you an idea of um, of what what kind of structures we're dealing with. Let me give you some simple examples. Well, if we start with an ample groupoid, there is already sort of a, a canonical example, which is 
roughly the same thing. It's not quite, to, to fit it in this framework, you have to copy the groupoid twice. So you have to have at least one zero section and at least one section with, with invertibles, right? So that's what I do. I have two groupoids. I just take the, they're exactly the same as G, take their disjoint union and define the, the product in my category like so. Um, and then, then indeed, so you get this, this bundle over G where each fiber has just two elements. One, one is a zero, one is a, an invertible element. Okay, and, and that gives you what you want. So this is, this is indeed an ample category bundle. And you'll note that if you, if you go back to considering these compact open bisections, then, then there's a, a corresponding characteristic function, which is really just a section of this bundle, right? Okay, and so, so in a sense, in a sense, we're dealing with the same structure. Continuous sections are really just the same as clopen subsets of the original group. You can generalize this by looking instead at some, some arbitrary discrete monoid with a zero. And uh, again, just look at this product with the usual product topology with the same kind of product here. So each of the fibers now is, is isomorphic to, well, isomorphic. I mean, you're not defining the product within, within fibers exactly, but, but these are essentially the same as, as M, right? With the product defined like so. Uh, and things get a little bit more interesting when you start introducing you know, twists. So, like, so uh, I think Lisa was mentioning before the, these uh, um, you know, discrete twists, right? Uh, and these come from co-cycles, which are really, really multiplicative things. And there's nothing to stop you from defining a co-cycle from a, a groupoid to a monoid. And, and then again, defining the, the product like so. And uh, yeah, got, yeah, I think you can even do it for non-commutative monoids, as long as you stick this thing in the middle rather than on the left or the right. Uh, and another, uh, well, yeah, I guess, well, even at this stage, maybe I should mention that, yeah, so far all of these examples have kind of the same fibers, but that's, that's not necessary at all. You can have vastly different fibers in, in, uh, in, uh, in different, you know, corresponding to different groupoid elements. And that's perfectly fine. That still fits within this, this definition of a, an atal category bundle. Um, and sort of, sort of, for example, or sort of for a non-example, you could look at, for example, uh, strongly saturated Bell bundles. Well, they're category bundles, but they're not ample for the very simple reason that the total space is not a tile. Right, for, the, for the total space to be a tile, well, that would in particular mean the topology on each fiber would be discrete. And that's definitely not true when your fibers are a C star algebras or Banach spaces even. Right? Okay, however, there is kind of a, a way of tweaking it to make it a tile. You can basically replace the fibers, I think, with, with germs of continuous sections. So this will massively blow up each fiber. Um, and the downside is it will, will turn, turn whatever you have into something probably very non housed off, right? But, uh, but that's fine within this framework, actually. I'm always assuming my base group voids are a house off, but I'm not assuming the total categories are housed off. That's, that's okay. So, so these don't exactly fit into my framework, however you can tweak them so they, they kind of do. Right? Is this strategy similar to if you would consider a, a twist over a group void as a central extension by just a copy of the circle everywhere? Then is this the same as view kind of the opposite of viewing that as a line bundle? Well, I mean, there's definitely correspondence between fell line bundles and, and these twists, right? But in, in either case, if you want to turn it to, into something to a, a tile, you're going to have to change the topology because even, oh, yeah. Yeah, even with the twist, you've still got the circle and the circle is not discrete, right? So, but, you, but yeah, I guess you could probably look at maps to the circle and look at the germs of those and, and then turn that into some kind of a tile, uh, a tile bundle if you want. Okay, so so we have our definition of ample category bundles. How do we now construct the corresponding semigroups? Well, we look at semigroups of sections. So let's start with our category bundle. Um, uh, well, let's just define the support as we usually do. So it's it's the sort of exact support. I'm not taking closures or anything here. It really is exactly all those elements for which your section A maps to something outside the zero section. And uh, well, actually, because I'm dealing with the tile bundles, often the support will already be closed. But that's and at this point, you can you can already define um, a product on these sections so long as even just one of the supports is a slice. I mean, normally you would do things by convolution, but to define convolution, you have this infinite sum. But if, if one of those is supported on a slice, then the infinite sum can have at most one non-zero term. So you don't even have to have any additive structure. You can just simply define the product like so. Okay, and well, you just note that 
you have the support of a product is compacted both of the both of those supports are and so what this tells you are these these compact slice supported sections they do indeed form a nice setting group under this product and then if you're coming from you know Boolean algebras or rainbow semigroups your next uh, your next the intuition would be to say, oh, now, okay, now I've got my center. Can I recover the bundle? And the simple answer is no, because there's definitely going to be lots of bundles floating around, uh, which give you the same semi group. I mean, I mean, if you basically, if you start with any non-trivial ample category bundle, let's say, you can trivialize it in the sense you can just take the semi group, five it over a single point. And they're definitely very different bundles, but the, the semi group of sections that you get in the end will be exactly the same. So this is not uh, this is a not enough data on its own. We need something extra. What what extra information could we require? Well, we can look at uh, well, we can look at expectations, for example. So again, there is this canonical map you have from arbitrary sections to the sections just supported on the unit space. You're just restricting essentially, although officially it's not restricting. If you're officially you're setting it. To zero outside the outside the unit space, uh, but still defines a, a nice map for you. And you also have some kind of well, is it a substitute for the diagonal, or some kind of even more restrictive kind of diagonal? We look at what I'll call uh, projections. So these are simply the sections whose whose values are always either zero or they lie within the the units of C. So in particular, they'll be item potents. Uh, but they won't necessarily be all item points. They're very a very special kind of item point. Uh, in particular, they're they're central within within the larger diagonal, consisting of all those elements whose support lies in the unit space. So these these can have arbitrary range, but as long as the support is lying in the unit space, and you look at the product with a one of these projections, well, it doesn't matter which way you go, uh, it's always going to be uh, commuting. Yeah, so in other words, these this special these projections are, are indeed central within the range of the, the expectation. And this is where these properties I briefly mentioned before come up again. So you can show that the this special subset of projections is, is bistable and, and normal in this, this semi-group. So normal is, I'm going to use this definition here, which doesn't require any star or any, any, any inverse or anything. You just say something is normal if, you know, whenever I multiply by some element n, then there's always a potentially different element n. I can multiply on the other side to get exactly the same result. And these properties are, are going to define what I what I will call a, a well-structured semigroup, for want of a better word. So it's the well-structured semigroup is a triple a semigroup, some sub semigroup, some semigroup of projections, some expectation phi satisfying certain properties. Not particularly important what they are, just they they are indeed satisfied whenever you construct the triple from uh, from some uh, ample category bundle to begin with. Okay, so again, we have some order structure on even an abstract well-structured semigroup. But here, here it's kind of interesting that you have, well, you have different order structures. There are at least two sort of natural generalizations of the canonical order you would have on an inverse semigroup. So I'm going to call these, these two different things restriction and domination. So restriction, uh, you say that A, A is a restriction of B if you can multiply on both the left and the right by some projection, one of these distinguished uh, elements and in order to get a right this is uh i think there are various names for very similar relations like the Nambu namburi pad order and the the mitch partial order etc this is some something similar right there's also this important domination relation which we will need in order to well, in order to find ultra filters in order to define the uh yeah to define the group weight that we want so here we say that a is dominated by b if i can if I can sort of find some special element S that sits nicely with respect to A and B, and also when you look at the product of B, S uh, and S, B, it sort of behaves like a unit with respect to A. It dominates A in that sense. So I'll give you perhaps a better intuition for what that really means in a second. But just for the moment, let me tell you that in inverse semigroups, these are really just the canonical order. Once you take your Z, your projections to really be the collection of all item potents, and when likewise, you, you let the range of phi be the the collection of item points. I guess I guess to define by itself, I would need meets, but the, the relations only rely on the range. And again, you can just take that to be the collection of items. Okay, if you 
So if you go back to this situation where you have some ample category bundle and you're looking at the canonical well-structured semigroup you get, the two relations have very concrete interpretations. And you can see why this is, I call this restriction. It really does mean that, that A is a kind of restriction to B. On the entire support of A, it has to agree with B. And domination is, is saying something really more about the supports, right? So for A to be dominated by B, it's basically saying that the support of A is contained in the support of B. There's a slight complication uh, in that we may have we may have many non-zero elements that are not invertible, and, and it's really looking at not the support, but really this invertible support. But, but you can think of it as basically saying support of A is contained in support of B. Okay. Um, and well, you can actually show that not only with this hold, but in fact, you can show A and B agree on some potentially slightly larger Clopin set. And using that, you can show that you also have these relative complements relative to the restriction relation. Just like before with you know, inverse semigroups, there are, there are again these relative complements. Okay, and uh, well, yeah, another minor thing to note, I guess, is that everything is indeed dominated by something. This is, this is basically compactness. So there is no, there is no maximal element if you're just looking at the domination relation. Uh, again, we have some kind of ladder structure going on here. It won't happen in general, but but it will happen for orthogonal elements. And normally, you know, for inverse semigroups, you would use the the inverse to define orthogonality. But here we can still get something basically the same, just using this distinguished set Z of, of projection. So we define orthogonality, and we note that again, you start with an ample category bundle, look at the well-structured semigroup, any two orthogonal sections, they they will indeed have a a, a kind of join. So they're, they're orthogonal precisely when uh, the supremums are disjoint and the supremums, the union, is a bisection. Because the union is a bisection, it means I can define a new section, which is basically A on the support of A and B on the support of B. That's it. And it is, it is a simple observation, but, but it's kind of important. And this is, this is, I guess, the reason why I'm getting away with working with semigroups rather than more general rings. So if this was a if, if I was dealing with a, a ring and these were you know, if fibers had some additive structure, well then this join here would really just be a sum, right? Yeah, but to get the duality to work, you don't need these arbitrary sums. All you need are these very specific sums, which here I'm showing you can really encode purely from the multiplicative structure, just as joins with respect to this relation defined from the multiplicative structure. Okay. Uh, distributivity is also sort of easy to verify. And when you look at projections, well, these in fact do form a lattice, you always have joins. And so, so there's a lot of random properties floating around here, but the point is I'm trying to, I'm trying to extract, you know, some nice algebraic properties of the, the triples you get out of this, right? Enough so that it really will characterize those and I can then set it up in some job. The precise conditions, I guess, are not so important. Yeah, the, the, the important thing is they're really algebraic conditions. So this leads to this notion, well, of a Steinberg semigroup. And I think I already mentioned well-structured semigroup, but just to reiterate, these are the conditions to define that. The Steinberg semigroup satisfies these extra more sort of lattice theoretic properties, right? So that, well, everything is dominated, you put a zero. And uh, most importantly, these, these have ortho suprema and it's distributive you know, and complex as well. And so to summarize everything I've gone through so far, what I've really said is that once you start with an ample category bundle, there's canonically a way you can define this, this nice algebraic object, which I'm calling a Steinberg semigroup. And yeah, maybe again, let's make a brief note about the Hausdorff condition here. So I am assuming G is Hausdorff, but, but not the total space C. If it is Hausdorff, well, that in particular means that each of these sections here actually has open support and in particular, there's sort of some minimal element. There's a support projection on, on both sides. And what that means is that you have a restriction semigroup, the, the things that uh, uh, Gunnar and, and Mark were looking at in detail in their work. So these, I mean, there's more things, I guess, to check, but, but really this shows that the Steinberg semigroups include Boolean restriction semigroups so long as they have meets. I don't think in general they needed meets, but I need meets because I, I, need, my, I need my expectation. So we know how to construct these nice, uh, you know, well-structured semigroups or Steinberg semigroups from our bundles. Uh, can we somehow recover the bundle? And we do it, yeah, exactly like before, right? We note that whenever you have a single point in your base groupoid, 
well, there are, there are, what is it? The, the, I, yeah, you have these ultra filters, right? And that there is indeed this, this bijection between the points and the, the ultra filters where you're not looking exactly at the non-zero elements anymore, but really the elements on which, uh, which get mapped to some invertible. So this is, if you like, why I had to make this assumption at the very beginning, right? That every fiber contains at least one invertible element. If I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to do this, this recovery. Right? Okay, and uh, well, that, that recovers the groupoid, but we want to recover the bundle as well. How would you recover the total space? Well, then you note that if two things are equal at a point, because I'm dealing with the tar bundles, they actually have to already be equal in some neighborhood. In more algebraic terms, what that means is there has to be some elements of the, the ultra filter corresponding to, I guess, the opposite of G, the inverse of G, um, such that when you multiply and then look at the expectation, you could do it the other way around as well, it doesn't matter, that these, in fact, are equal. Okay, so what this tells you is that you can not only recover the base groupoid, but you can even recover the fibers as well, just by looking at equivalence classes relative to, to these ultra filters. So, yeah. So hopefully, I know it's a lot of stuff, but hopefully I haven't, everyone. Okay, so now the, the last step is, is to, to go really abstract, right? You start with some abstract Steinberg semigroup and you want to construct the category bundle from the, the very beginning. But we do it as before. You look at ultra filters, same product as before, just to find our ultra filter group points. Okay, and we now we have this extra equivalence relation uh, to define the actual total space of our bundle. And then you just uh, you just pair these up, right, to to get you the indeed the total space of the bundle, right? Like the equivalence classes, I guess, on their own are not quite there. You really have to do specify uh, which ultra filter you're you're doing things up. And once you do that. You would in, again get a nice category, forms the total space of your bundle, define the, the actual bundle map in the way you would expect, where you just take the projection onto the second coordinate. And this is this is it. You get your, your ample category bundle. Uh, the topology on the total space yeah, is, I guess, a little bit slightly tricky to define. I mean, it's you just look at the, the inverse images of the, the open sets in the base space together with open sets you get from from elements of A. So this is kind of like how you would define the, the topology on U, except now we're defining it on these, these finer equivalence classes, that's all. Okay, so we have the bundle, but, but we're not done yet. We have to actually represent the, the structured semigroup, the Steinberg semigroup we started with as actual sections of this bundle we have created. Uh, but that's not too hard, take an element, you want to know what the section it should be, we'll just map every ultra filter to the corresponding equivalence class. That's all. And uh, you do have to check things though. You have to check this is this is actually what's faithful, that it gives you a semi-group isomorphism, and that it maps the, the special sub sub semigroups to you know this sub semigroup of projections to the actual projections with respect to this bundle. And that the expectation you started with becomes the canonical expectation where you restrict to the units. So this is the sort of the first result, really. So this is Steinberg semigroups really are dual, at least as far as the objects go, to ample category bundles. Why are these two maps we have defined? Okay. So what about morphisms though? Well, morphisms of any algebraic structure are fairly uh, fairly easy to find. They're just structure preserving maps, right? I guess the only thing I need to point out is that that I also want to preserve the, the joins here. The joins are defined by the, the product structure. However, I think you could preserve the product structure without necessarily preserving the joins. So I need to, to state that explicitly in my definition of a morphism. If you have such a morphism, then, then you want to define a morphism of the, the corresponding spaces, at least. I mean, the bundles, but first and foremost, the spaces. So how do you define a continuous map there? We just take pre-image. Right? Take an ultra filter, look at its pre-image, might not be up its closed, but as soon as you take the up its closure, it will it will actually become an ultra filter. So long as so long as again uh, that that this preemptive is not completely empty, so that's part of the theory. So it only gets you a partial map. The, the morphisms here, just like if when you're dealing with Cester algebras, if you want to actually get a duality which deals with arbitrary Cester algebra, you know, commutative Cester algebra homomorphisms, uh, then you then you have to allow for partial maps between the spaces. Right? If you don't want to deal just with unit things and here again, it's it's convenient and I think more than just convenient, I think it really is fundamental. You really have to allow yourself to deal with, with partial maps. 
That's all right. We like Drupal. We're happy with partial. So using this, you get the, a map between the spaces, and it's it's a bit complicated. But then you have to take a pullback bundle and then take a bundle morphism the other way. And just trust me that it is indeed possible to define such a a bundle morphism from the the pie that you started with. So in this way, you can indeed construct certain PS morphisms. These are complicated, but they are nothing more than generalizations of the the morphism Pierce was considering way back in the, the 60s, right? And so you get you get this correspondence between the morphisms, which indeed gives you an actual full-on categorical duality. Okay, so that's that's really all the multiplicative part done. I should at least mention the the ring and algebraic part. Uh, and there it's it's fairly plain sailing, actually. You, all the hard work is really done. But if you do if you do want to have some additive structure, that's perfectly fine. You want to look at bundles which aren't just you know bundles of categories over groupoids. You want the fibers to also have some additive structure. Okay, so assume you have such a bundle. Assume it's the additive structure is compatible with the product structure you already have. Well, then, as we all know, you can extend the product now using convolution. Now we have sums, and now we can look at sections which are defined on any compact subset. It doesn't have to be a bisection anymore. The expectation, um, it also extends to this larger ring you have now, and, uh, and it also respects now the additive structure. And so now you end up with, with uh, something more general. You end up with a, well, a Steinberg semigroup in that sense I defined before with now some extra ring. So the, the semigroup now generates this ring. And there's, uh, I think, a couple of little compatibility conditions that, uh, yeah, I don't really need to go into those. Right? So this, this is your generalization of, uh, it, is a, it is a purely algebraic generalization of a Steinberg algebra, or, or I guess, perhaps even better, it, it's, it is essentially a generalization of these uh, quasi Cartan pairs that were considered by, by these various people, right? I, yeah, in my paper, I, I actually spent a bit of time showing explicitly that from a quasi Cartan pair, you can, you can extract the right semigroup and the right projections, et cetera, to actually get you one of these Steinberg rings. Okay, so from a Steinberg ring, you can construct one of these ringoid bundles in exactly the same way. Look at ultra filters, look at equivalence classes. Just note that this equivalence relation is even better now. It even works on the entirety of your ring. And and again, it's just it's just verifying that everything works pretty much. That the additive structure observes. And so this is the, the final result. Basically, most of the work was done at the product level and and it all is plain sailing from there. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it.